Good evening and welcome to Lowell Observatory's ongoing celebration of the 10th anniversary of our Lowell Discovery Telescope. Going Ten celebration years ago, of the 10th anniversary of the largest telescope in the continental United States. And in that time, our astronomers and astronomers from our partner institutions have used it to do all sorts of exciting research. Um, and throughout the year, we've been talking about this research. Uh, my name is Kevin Schindler. I'm the historian and public information officer at Lowell Observatory. It's been my honor to be able to talk about the LDT, as we call it here throughout the year. And joining me today is fitting because um, when LDT started 10 years ago, um, the guy right next to me, Stephen Levine, who is the LDT scientist, he was part of that group who got together and made it happen. And he's been um, helping lead the efforts with LDT since then. Um, and then on the other side is Amanda Bosch, who is a longtime astronomer here also, and also the chief operating officer here at Lowell Observatory. So for this final episode of the year, celebrating the LDT, um, we thought we'd kind of review some of the, the highlights of discovery and also the, what it means to Lowell Observatory. Um, think about the heritage of Lowell Observatory, the heritage of research and how this telescope fits into that. And also think about the future and how this sets us up um, to be a major research facility to continue in that role down the road. Um, so those are some of the things we're gonna talk about. Um, I have to point out, we're also joined by the spirit of Clyde Tombaugh. Um, we're actually sitting in Amanda's office. And this office, if we go back, um, whatever, 90 plus years, this was the office of Carl Lampland, um, who was one of the astronomers here in 1930, when Clyde Tombaugh discovered Pluto. Clyde's office was just across the hallway from here. And at four o'clock in the afternoon, on February 18th, 1930, he was looking through the blink comparator machine that he used to analyze these pictures he took and realized he thought he had discovered a new planet. And he walked over into this office right where we're sitting and said, Mr. Lampland, can you come over here and help me with this? Because I think we've got it. And they spent um, a little bit of time analyzing the pictures. And then Carl Lampland said, I, I think you're onto something. And Clyde walked down to the end of this hallway into the director's office, which now Dr. Jeffrey Hall is in, our executive director, but back then it was BM Slifer, and said, Dr. Slifer, I think we found your planet X. And so we're sitting, and this is Lowell Observatory, this, this continuum of cutting edge research. And so to be able to talk about the LDT and, and the research it does today with the spirit of Clyde Tumbaugh right behind us is kind of interesting. Um, now the technology has certainly changed. If we go and look at, at the, the telescope used to cover Pluto, it's like a tinker toy. It's a tube, and a couple of dials, and that's it. But, but the Little Discovery Telescope is a lot different. Maybe Stephen, you can tell how it might be slightly different than the telescope used to cover Pluto. Well, it's, it is slightly different, but it is still, well, it's an open structure tube now with a couple of optics, a little bit bigger. A little bit bigger, and the truth is that we have traded a lot of weight and all the other things for uh, complexity only in the things you don't see directly. So all the things you're referring to as being modern technology are all basically hidden behind the optics. It's still a two mirrors and a detector at the back, whereas for Clyde it was a lens and a piece of film as his detector. For us it's two mirrors, except that one of those mirrors is flexible and has a large number of computer mm -hmm. controls to keep the, the figure proper, but we still use it basically the same way. And the goal is the same, is to, is to explore the universe mm -hmm. and, and study it and understand more about the universe around us, and maybe, maybe even get to understanding our origins a little bit. That seems to be a, you know, kind of a keynote um, thing that we're all interested in. Amanda, um, you've been you've been here at Lowell Observatory since uh, <laughs> for several years. A couple of years, <laughs> and so how's that? How's that change? I mean, you you certainly are familiar with the the legacy. Your office has this history, but but that's the neat thing about Lowell. It's not it's not a, you know this time in history. It's a continuum. We've been doing this research for so long. How have you seen it change through time 
since understanding the history to when you first got here to now. You are you are exactly correct. There's a lot of history at Lowell and a lot of the work that gets done here, not all of it, but a lot of the work that gets done here really has that sort of long legacy. So, um, you know, some of these searches for Planet X have continued um, to the day to today when we're looking for um, asteroids, you know, out in the outer solar system, quiver belt objects, or we're looking at some of these bodies for to get, you know, to learn more about them. And so um, there are also long-term studies of, of certain stars. Um, Jeff Hall's long-term study of the sun, for instance, would be one of them to look at, you know, what is happening with the sun over time. Um, that is something that has now sort of transitioned over to the LDT with uh, probably um, one of the smaller telescopes that we have using the um, LOST telescope out at the LDT site. Which stands for? Lowell, Lowell Observatory Solar mm -hmm. Telescope. Mm -hmm. right? And it's mounted on the um, building next door to the LDT and it's and then there's a small fiber. It's a, I don't know, how big is that telescope? It's big. The, the entrance aperture is probably two inches. Yeah, it's pretty mm -hmm. small. And then it, the, the light is taken from that telescope via a fiber to um, the express instrument over at the LDT. And then so every day when it's not cloudy, um, and even when it is cloudy, data are being collected so we can continue studying the sun. And so some of those long-term um, projects have been part of Lowell's history and continue to be part of Lowell's present and then also looking toward the future. And that's an interesting thing you mentioned with LOST because you're looking, comparing the sun to sun-like stars. Yes. So we're comparing this big, huge, in our perspective, this big ball of gas that's close to us to pinpoints. And so maybe explain a little bit how that works of, you know, you said the, that little couple inch tube, you're, you're using that to collect light from the sun and a 14 foot diameter mirror to collect from the stars, but they go to the same place. They go into the same instrument. It's called mm -hmm. Express, um, and the um, the Lost project. That's um, Joe Lama's um, project, and um, what he is trying to do is to look at how does the sun compare to other to sun-like stars, or maybe we'll flip that. How do sun-like stars mm -hmm. compare to our sun? Because when we're looking at some of these um, objects, we need to, and if, if we're trying to find um, planets around them and to see what that might look like. We need to understand what does our sun look like because our sun is not, when you look at just the light coming from the sun, it's not just constant. There are sunspots, for instance, on our sun and presumably on sun-like stars as well. And so that will affect the, um, you know, the amount of light that we're getting back from from our sun and from these stars. And we can, we need to, in order to be able to really understand what's happening um, with, when we're looking at planets around other stars, we need to understand also what's happening with these stars themselves. And it, it really tells us about the evolution of the sun. I mean, it we does, can look at yeah. the sun at this moment in time, but it's what, four and a half billion years old. It's a middle-aged star. And so That's by right. looking at other similar stars, we can kind of project, understand what's gonna happen with them over time. We can look, we can use that to really kind of map out what our sun might be doing in the, have done in the past or be doing in the future. But then there's also other components of them because those stars are not exactly like our sun. And so we also need to map out if you have a slightly different metallicity, what does that do to the, you know, to this, this behavior? So there's a, there's a, a number of different axes in this phase space that need to be explored. And something you mentioned, we, we talked about the Lowell Discovery Telescope, and then you mentioned Express, mm -hmm. one of the instruments. And maybe, um, Stephen, you could talk a little bit about, uh, you know, there's a telescope and there's instruments. What, you know, one collects light, one, you know, talk about why you have different instruments and why the LDT is so important. Well, I think, I think what you want to start with is that the telescope itself, if, if you, let's step back and take a, a camera in analogy, which people might be a little more familiar with, but the very first instrument on the telescope was our large monolithic imager, which is an optical detector. But you can think of that as being the detector itself is your camera, and the telescope is a 25,000 millimeter f6 lens, which obviously you're not going to want to tote around with you, but basically the telescope's job is to provide light to any instrument you put behind it. And then the nicety is 
the, the telescope carries is capable of carrying up to five instruments at a time, which means we can do a diverse range of projects in a short amount of time. But it also means that if I start a project, say I start with an optical imager, then I'm taking a direct picture of those objects in the sky. And I might look at that picture and go, hey, wait a minute, something's changed from the last time I took a picture of this. Now you might be taking images to, under, to watch something vary in brightness. For example, if you look at an asteroid, as it rotates, you'll see a change in brightness often. And from that, you can figure out a rotation period, some of the physical properties. Or you might look at some various kinds of variable stars. And it's, you directly monitor the, the change in brightness. And for certain kinds of stars, that change, the period of that change in brightness can be used to tell you how far away the star is. And you can use the star as a candle, a stand, what's known as a standard candle, to mm -hmm. estimate how far the galaxy is that it's in, for example. And this is, in fact, one of the ways the scale of the universe is computed. But it's also the kind of thing where you can say, wait a minute, I'm looking at something in my field and say the brightness has changed dramatically since last night or an hour ago even. Something is different. And the beauty with the LDT is that because we carry multiple instruments, we also carry several spectrographs. And understanding the physical change in this, in this object Having the spectrograph available allows us to actually look at compositional changes, potentially velocity changes, that would allow us to characterize how this thing has suddenly varied from what it used to be. And many telescopes, you can only mount one instrument at mm -hmm. a time. And so the ability to do a sudden change, and you know, honestly, science is often about something you didn't expect or something you didn't foresee. And if you, want, if you have an instrument on tonight, and on four meter telescopes, instruments tend to be big, then you're kind of stuck unless you have a setup like at the LDT where you say, well, I'm taking, I'm taking photographs right now, I'm taking digital photographs right now, but something is different. I have access to this spectrograph to look at, say, this supernova that I didn't expect to see in this galaxy and suddenly, hey, I can start to characterize what it is that's different about this in a very quantitative way that I couldn't just do with a photograph. And it really is, is such a dramatic change. You're talking about, you know, like traditional large telescopes. It could take a day or two to take one instrument off and another one on. In this case, it's almost simultaneous within a half minute or so. Um, I mean, it takes a few minutes, but yeah. the truth is three or four minutes is basically simultaneous observing. Right, and so you can really, a supernova or a comet, you can look at it in a lot of different ways. Uh, and and I think that gets to another important aspect of Lowell Observatory that we own our own telescopes. And there's the flexibility. Maybe you talk about that a little bit. Well, that, I mean, that is a, when you have a telescope of this class, most of these are either national facilities or used by a wide range of communities. And so you are constrained at some level to try to do your best to provide it, something to everybody. Mm -hmm. And we do that too, but our community is somewhat smaller. We are Lowell, the, the Lowell science staff, the broader Lowell staff, but also we have partners who are here explicitly to want to use the telescope. But even then, it's still, we have five partners, Yale University, Boston University, University of Maryland, our neighbors at Northern Arizona University, folks at the University of Toledo. And the nicety is because we own the telescope and because they have formal partnerships with us, we can plan things longer in advance, but we can also afford to make changes on very short notice. And the only community we have to satisfy is everybody within that group, which is not to say that that's always easy. <laughs> um, there is quite a diverse set of scientific interests within these six institutions. But how unique is that? It's actually not particularly. I mean, the diversity of interest mm -hmm. is not particularly unique in that sense. Um, but the ability to 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 go to different objects and say, "Oh, this is this is coming up tonight. Let's let's jump on that." Um, I think I'll turn your question around slightly and say one of the things that the telescope allows us to do, and by virtue of owning it we can make decisions over how we use the time. Mm -hmm. Basically, observers within our community request time and we put together a schedule 
And one of the things that we do on a somewhat more flexible, in a, in a more flexible way than many places is how we partition the time. Okay. And so, you know, on say tonight, there could be up to four different programs within the one night. Whereas on many telescopes, you're usually limited to one or two. It doesn't sound like a big deal, but when you start to have programs where someone says, well, what I really want is I want to monitor this object every four days. That used to be almost mm -hmm. impossible where you get, you were given time, well, you've got tonight, Amanda's got tomorrow night, you can come back in a week. But if we do it every quarter of a night, for example, then I could have a quarter tonight and a quarter tomorrow, and a, you know, I could have three quarters this week and three quarters next mm -hmm. week. And so one of the programs that's on this semester, so out of 180 days in our semester, the scheduling semester, at least one of the programs is on, on 92 of those nights. I can't think of another telescope that has that level of flexibility for this degree of, of, of programmatic response. Mm -hmm. and I'm going to jump in with just another aspect of that, because at the LDT, one of the things that we do that's kind of cool, and other telescopes do this as well, but we have this um, opportunity to do this target of opportunity. And so what that means is um, if something comes up, say suddenly there's a supernova, um, someone can put in a proposal ahead of time and say, if there's a really cool supernova, I'm going to want to observe it. And if that proposal is accepted, and so basically they would just sit and wait. And then let's say a supernova goes off, then they can say, okay, I'm going to trigger my target of opportunity time. And they can just come right in and say, okay, tonight it's a supernova went off. I need to get images and I need to get spectra. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just really be have that opportunity. The, that ability to react really quickly yep. to whatever is happening because we can't we can predict a lot about what is you know where the where stars are going and where things in our solar system are going but we can't predict everything and yeah, so and as Stephen has said yeah yeah there's things that happen yeah unexpectedly you have to be able to adapt quickly yes and it is worth putting this in real quantitative terms in the sense that a target of opportunity like that you could literally respond within five to ten minutes I mean something happens now, the telescope could be turned over mm -hmm. to respond to that. Very, very quickly. Yeah. And you could even, because of this ability, you could switch instruments as well. Because mm -hmm. if somebody is using the imager, but you need the spectrograph, it could it could happen. So is that is it your responsibility? You're the, you're the LDT scientist. Um, describe what, what that means. And is, are you the one, like God, you hold the power? If, you know, <laughs> Power. <laughs> and if so, how does your paycheck, you know, relate to that? Is Unfortunately, the, the government <laughs> power does not come with the title, and the paycheck does not reflect that. Um, now, basically, as the telescope scientist, a big part of what I try to do is to bring the science community that's using the telescope together with the engineering and operational community that makes the telescope do what you want. And so, if Amanda says, I want to observe this tonight, it's not necessarily directly my responsibility, but part of what I do in creating the schedule is to make sure that her needs are already known to tonight's telescope operator, that the instrument she's going to need is in fact available, that you know, if she needs specific filters for an imager, for example, those filters are listed so that there's no, you know, the beginning of the night doesn't start and you go, oh, I really wanted that one, and it's not there mm -hmm. because changing filters takes time. Similarly, it's the kind of thing where occasionally someone will say, you know, I'd like to do this, but I need to do it then. I'm not assigned that time. Can I? And so, you know, I can broker things between, you know, well, so and so's on the first part of the night. They're probably amenable to talking about it. So informally, we can also try to help observer A talk to observer mm -hmm. B, for example. But another part of it is, I, part of, what I get is a broad overview of what's being done because I schedule the telescope every six months, four, six months worth of programs. And it means that I can look at this and go, well, there's a lot of interest in using this instrument, for example, and make sure that I can, you know, our instrument support group knows that this instrument is in heavy demand. Um, basically, it's, a, it's, a, it's an attempt to make sure that the telescope operates in the most efficient manner mm -hmm. possible for the scientists trying to do the science. 
Um, we have one thing as an institution, we have something that we wouldn't really get somewhere else on a telescope this size, and that is time. Um, you know, because Lowell owns the telescope, it means that an observer at Lowell could get a significant amount of time. By that, I mean, you know, they could say, I want six or seven nights this semester, for example. Whereas if you applied to a national facility, you might be lucky to get one or two. But it also means we have enough time that you could consider taking on projects where the risk that they would fail is high. But if they succeeded, you might have a really, really unusual discovery. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's certainly something that we want to get to is looking at the research that's been done with it over the past 10 years and what the capabilities are of the telescope and its instruments looking down the road. Um, before we get to that, um, I just want to say that for those watching, if you have comments or questions, make sure to write them in and our crack behind the scenes team, Cody and Maddie will get them to us and we'll answer them either as they come in or an appropriate time later on. Um, we also want to thank um, so many supporters here at Lowell Observatory that helped make this all happen. Um, we have Mr. A, who's been very supportive um, with our Discord channel, a friend of Lowell Observatory, and a great example of somebody who cares about the observatory um, and helps support our programs. And we have so many other supporters that, that we really appreciate that help make the science and we're just talking about the science, but there's also communicating the science, um, our, our outreach side of things. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's really what makes it all work. We think of it as a team that there are so many people on Lowell staff, but we also have our advisory board members, our um, friends of Lowell Observatory, and other supporters who make this happen. So we really uh, appreciate all that work. Um, so let's talk about those. those uh, you know, we were having an interesting conversation the other day about talking about um, discoveries versus research. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we, you can talk about this all night, but, you know, you think about, you know, people want to know what discoveries were made with it. And we think of, you know, it almost makes it difficult because Pluto was discovered here, the first evidence of the expanding universe, and people expect, you know, <laughs> world-changing things. But, but so much of the research um, isn't, isn't that necessarily that big discovery, but it's, long-term studies, which is made possible by owning our own telescopes, and, you know, characterizing things um, mm -hmm. that maybe it's not a big, I didn't discover life um, on Mars, but it still tells us a lot about, it. so let's talk about that a little bit, because I think that's a fascinating um, discussion. Well, I mean, I think it's fair to say when you look at a facility, or let, let, let's step back and take Clyde's discovery original. Mm -hmm. Clyde's discovery would have been <laughs> yeah, right. would have been two plates on two given nights. But the reality is that search, and he got lucky early, mm -hmm. but that search could have gone on for years before and, finding and, something. And it went on for years afterwards. Exactly. Yeah. Right, right. And in a way, that illustrates some of what we do on a regular basis at LDT in the sense that we have programs that are explicitly long-term programs. It is, again, one of the great abilities given to us by owning the telescope is that we can plan for projects that we expect to take one and a half, two, three, five, even 10 years to do, knowing that we will have access to this telescope in time to complete the program. Um, I would, you know, I'd give a call out, for example, we have, there's this ongoing program through the Yale that was started with the Yale group to look for earth mass planets around low mass stars. But the truth is to find planets orbiting other stars, you need enough time to see enough of a fraction of an orbit mm -hmm. to detect the shift, which means that if the orbit is two years, you need the better part of two to three years to really not only detect it, but confirm it. And part of that program is saying, we can guarantee that you will be able to commit to taking observations over the course of at least that long. And so when that program started, one of, the require, one of the requests, which became a requirement to us, was we want the telescope to be as physically similar throughout the first five years of this program as possible, because everything you change introduces a little bit of a systematic difference. And the program was pushing to the very edge of the envelope of what you could do. And so 
we coordinated the reilluminization of our primary mirror, which is a very invasive operation, i.e. we take the entire telescope apart, to be done right before they installed the instrument for the start of survey, because we know we could go five to six years before having to take it apart again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at, at another facility, you can't necessarily guarantee that, but we could say, look, we understand the importance of this, we understand that, we can coordinate the time with them. And, and you talk about coordinating time, there's, there's a lot of coordination with astronomy. Um, you work with, with your team, um, with the operators, with, with other observatories. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it brings up, you know, one of the recent projects with LDT, with the DART mission. Mm -hmm. You know, we think about a lot of the research that's being done, and sometimes people say, how did that impact me? Well, DART is a great example of how Lowell is involved in something that get, gets the attention of people around the world, the idea of something out there, a quote unquote killer asteroid that could come our way. Right. Um, planetary defense, how do we protect ourselves from such a thing? And DART, the double asteroid redirect um, test, um, that, that's one of the things it tested is, can we do something about it? And, and that involves coordination of observatories around on all the continents. Um, how, did, how did that work? And why did Lowell, the, the LDT play such a key role with that? and continue to play a role with it? Well, I mean, it's some of it's a matter of the telescopes you have access to. But the, the nice and the thing that people have to understand is that, in fact, observations in support of the DART mission started long before the impact that everybody saw in the news, because you had to characterize the system so you knew what it was before you slammed the spacecraft in mm -hmm. high velocity into the this orbiting moon of this asteroid. That's right. You had to see what it was before so you know if it changed. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, for example, the the combined uh, Didymos dimorphous system was faint enough for a large portion of the time that to be able to characterize the orbit of this small moon around its primary asteroid, you needed relatively large telescopes. And so, LDT was one of several telescopes that was used by the group, the groups actually involved in this. Mm -hmm. There are a number of folks at Lowell who are directly involved, as well as our uh, partner institutions like the University of Maryland, in, and mm -hmm. obviously many, many more. So uh, on our staff, there was um, Nick Moskovitz and yeah. Teddy Coretta, mm -hmm. and then a NAU partner, um, Christina, Thomas. Christina Thomas. Thomas. Mm -hmm. There are folks at the University of Maryland, mm -hmm. and now the University uh, the Naval Academy, Matthew, Matthew Knight, Knight mm -hmm. Tony Farnham. But part of what it was was, you know, they, we would get, they would get observations at, at the LDT, at the Magellan Telescope, essentially any telescope large enough to get good images of this system early on. It turned out the LDT was well-placed and they were able to get enough time on it, which is one of the benefits of owning it, mm -hmm. that the LDT data were a very important portion of the prior to impact characterization the impact itself was not directly visible from here immediately. So other telescopes were used for the very earliest emission, but LDT has been used regularly since not very now, since within a week or two after the impact mm -hmm. to watch the evolution of that system since, and will probably be used longer than most others because it is large enough, but also has pointing limitations that are broad enough that it should be able to image the system mm -hmm. longer than many other telescopes. And I can just jump in here and say that how, um, if, if a body is visible from a particular telescope depends upon where it is in the sky. And so during, at the impact, um, the Didymos Dimorphos system was down in the Southern hemisphere. And so it wasn't visible mm -hmm. from here, but that's, that's what creates that particular constraint. Mm -hmm. And Amanda, you, in your position, I mean, you're, you oversee the operations of Lowell Observatory. Mm -hmm. and, and beyond that, kind of a big picture look at Lowell and the community, the mm -hmm. scientific community that flags that different communities. But so what does, what's the impact of Lowell being involved with something the scale of DART? I mean, what does that, what does that mean for the observatory and for those who, you know, right. love the right. observatory? Absolutely. I think it's, I mean, one of the things we need to be just sort of thinking about is, you know, 
as an observatory, as a you know part of Arizona and a part of the United States, we really are not just that, but we're also a member. Of, you know, we're part of the world. Mm -hmm. And when we look at a at a, at a um, an experiment like DART, I mean, that particular asteroid was not going to be hitting the Earth, mm -hmm. so we weren't. You know, that wasn't part. That wasn't the reason for this. But we are looking at how if we do have if we do discover something that is coming at us, has our name on it, then um, we can't start at that point thinking about what do we do? We have to start these experiments ahead of time to say, can we redirect an asteroid that is coming, that will be coming toward us in 50 years or something like that? And so this experiment is a really important part of figuring out when we see that, what do we do about it? Mm -hmm. And so Lowell played this critical role in understanding, you know, setting up, like Stephen was saying, setting, understanding, setting up that, you know, figuring out what that light curve is so that we could see that something did change after the impact. And um, so it, 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 we're part of that experiment to really understand what we can do in the future to potentially save humanity, you know, and that's, uh, and not just humanity, everybody else on this planet. <laughs> so. <laughs> All the others. All the others too. Um, and so, the, I mean, that's a, it's a, it's an honor to be involved in such a large project that really has a, a much broader reach than just for our scientists here, but and for the, you know, for the collaboration, but just beyond that. And it really gets at the core of, of Lowell Observatory is, is helping unveil the secrets of the universe and inspire people. And, it, and that certainly ties in um, this kind of global awareness um, of, you know, associated with our science is communicating science and we're building the new Astronomy Discovery Center. Mm -hmm. And that the goal of that is to be a, a premier destination in the world for communicating science. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can say a little yeah. bit about that, how yeah. it ties in. I think that, um, so the Astronomy Discovery Center is slated to open in 2024. And um, as an observatory, we, the, the astronomers here, you know, observe the universe and learn about it. And we convey um, our, our knowledge, our discoveries, um, to the public. And so the Astronomy Discovery Center is going to be that is going to help us to be able to do that even better and to more people. And so, you know, even even now when we um, when we had the dart, um, when the dart impact happened, we had a huge crowd here at Lowell Observatory, even though the Astronomy Discovery Center is not open. Um, we had a huge crowd here viewing the um, viewing the data coming back. And Nick Moskovitz was there, you know, giving everybody the, um, you know, talking it through and explaining what was happening, which was just amazing to be able to mm -hmm. have that. And when we open the, um, the ADC, the Astronomy Discovery Center, you know, we're going to be able to do more of that for more people. Um, and it's it's um, it's going to have a greater impact um, just on the um, on the world of astronomy and just being able to convey all of that information. And you you know you think about science centers and there are a lot of great science centers. Yes. But to be affiliated with a research center like like Lowell Observatory, that's that's pretty cool. And, and to to be able to rely on the science that's being done right here and other science also of course, mm -hmm. but but. That combination is is pretty unique. It's a it's a it's a working observatory mm -hmm. with a, a very vibrant public outreach program, and so we can show people, you know, what it is, what is what is the life of an astronomer, what does an astronomer do, how do um, you know how do you spend time at the telescopes and. Um, and then allow people to look through the telescopes that we have here mm -hmm. on Mars Hill as well. Um, we, um, in fact, we've just started tours of the LDT as mm -hmm. well. Um, so uh, it's it gives people this opportunity to, um, you know, to really, in some cases, get information hot off the presses. Mm -hmm. You know, th this thing was observed last night at the LDT, and this is what it looks like. Um, and so that's something that um, you know really gives gives us this opportunity to um, multiply our um, our reach and our you know what we can share with people. And you know that gets back gets back to one of the 
the um, ideas of our founder, Percival Lowell, who said, what's the point of doing science unless you share it? Make, make everybody co-discoverers mm -hmm. so they can understand it too. And that, and like you said, this visitor center, the new astronomy discovery center really gets at that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think you were talking about the DART um, mission and Nick and Teddy um, were up here at the, at the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory. And I think that the poignant moment for me was when um, the last, you know, we knew that the last image was taken and Nick has his iPad and he's got the last image taken. In one hand, he's got the iPad and the other hand, he's got his daughter. Yes. And it's just that connecting the generations and mm -hmm. accessible to everybody. It's not just about the science, it's about humanity and, and we're all people doing this. Right. And it, it just was was really a poignant moment, like you said. It really was. And yeah. that, that's that's what it is here at Lowell Observatory. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and um, you know, we talked about the, you know, the LDT has been around for 10 years. Um, maybe we can talk about that a little bit. When you were 10 years ago, Stephen, when um, you know, surviving a the the secondary mirror that cracked when it was being produced. Um, that that caused some consternation. You have um, to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> and it, you know, it's any big project has challenges. And what was it like? Maybe describe that night when you did see first light, and what that feeling was. Um, and first light, yeah. when you maybe describe well, what that is too. I mean, I'll, I'll split that one into two pieces because there were really two different mm -hmm. periods. There was first light, which institutionally had the formal meaning of the telescope is all put together. We have put a real camera on it and we're using it the way we use it now. And on that first light, we had an image and it all worked together. The telescope pointed, the mirror, yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we got real pictures of real objects, just like we would now with a little more effort because not everything was as automated at that point, we were still obviously working on the systems. But there was a time, oh, almost six months before that, that I call zero of light because first light has this more formalized meaning where we first had a camera on most of the telescope in the sense that <laughs> the telescope has two mirrors and you've kindly reminded me of the consternation mm -hmm. that existed when the second, the original secondary mirror was partially, partially figured and they were in the process of what is known as light waiting. And there was a little more stress in the glass than expected and it literally came apart. Ignoring all of the jumping up and down that followed that, mm -hmm. We were able to keep the project moving while we looked for an appropriate replacement. And part of what we did was to put a camera up where that mirror would go. So we had a single mirror bringing light to focus on this one camera up at the top end of the telescope, what you call the prime focus. And there was a night where we were able to point the telescope at a star with a camera focus the light on the camera. So basically the entire process is there, just we're missing a few of our pieces. And we got a star. And the very, very first image we had, the star looks, I mean, anybody else would go, oh, that looks terrible. It kind of looks like the letter J. But the reality is we didn't have the support structure for the primary mirror operating entirely at that point. And yet we still had something that was close to what looks like a good image. Three weeks later, we had pinpoint stars from the telescope on that camera. And that's when we knew it would work. The basic, basically what it boiled down to was that the whole system was untested up to that point. And this was enough of a test to guarantee to us that the really critical systems would do what we hoped and we would have a usable telescope. And that was basically crossing a divide where we really didn't know. Before that, we were looking at this going, it's a very expensive investment and we don't know if it will work. We I think it should, we hope it should, but once we had that image, we could say, this will work. We're not done. We still have a secondary mirror that needs mm -hmm. to be finished and put in and new instruments to build for it. But the critical systems that would have been most difficult to do were done. 
And I believe that's the first um, round of champagne bottles that were popped <clears throat> and toast made. <laughs> I, like, I remember I some pictures from that. <laughs> so there might, there might have been a little <laughs> celebration at the time, yes. Uh, well, that's such a major step when you know it's, it's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it was, you know, and it's it's the kind of thing where the telescope is now so... We understand its operation well enough, but we also understand its scheduling enough and its instrumentation mm -hmm. that we can plan to do things like, for example, one of our astronomers has observations coming up next semester that will be coordinated with the Hubble Space Telescope mm -hmm. and several other ground-based institutions at the same time. And we are in a place where we can legitimately commit to being able to support that and know that mm -hmm. you know, the, the weather may not cooperate, but the facility will be there ready to provide the observations that they will yep. need. And that kind of coordination really multiplies the impact of, you know, it's not just our telescope anymore, it's us plus the Hubble Space mm -hmm. Telescope plus, you know, other instruments on the ground. And the sum of that is more than any one of them would have done on its own. Yep. Yes, yes. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the operation. We got a, a question from Drew um, asking if we ever manually guide big telescopes anymore and then compare that to how they did it in the old days and the accuracy <laughs> back then compared oh, to now. <laughs> the good old days. The good old oh, days, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you don't, you, you still can manually guide. Um, but we turn yeah, you can. the time. You could. You don't, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't <laughs> why? Well, sometimes you don't need full-on guiding. Mm -hmm. I mean, the truth of the matter is our telescope, how well it tracks an object depends critically on what's known as our pointing model. And if we get that right, in fact, it's good enough and we can keep it going that way that you don't actually need the additional corrections for many of your, of your observations. Occasionally, you'll look at it and go, well, ding, 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 and you'll make a, a slight correction. But then there are things where you have a much, you know, I'm going to be on this field for the next three hours. The best pointing model still has trouble being perfect for that. At which point we do have a guider and you engage the guider and it takes care of it instead of my sitting there like a, like an old video game going <laughs> left, right, left, right, left, right. But you still can. Like this guy did. Yes. Yeah. With a little yeah. telescope, um, staring through a guide telescope and mm -hmm. tweaking it back and forth and staring for hours at a time. You could. Mm -hmm. I don't recommend it. <laughs> Having done that, it is not uh, <laughs> pleasant. Um, yeah. Earlier in my career, yes, being you know having to stand at a telescope and look through that guide scope with mm -hmm. the you know the crosshairs in there mm -hmm. and keep a, a star on the crosshairs by, as Stephen said, playing the video game of pushing the buttons mm -hmm. and moving the telescope. Um, it's uh, it's it's done automatically now through this guide camera and software that mm -hmm. you know looks at a star and keeps it on the same pixel and then moves the telescope to bring it back there and um and interestingly the guide the guides camera on the ldt we also use for science occasionally mm -hmm. um, because it can just take it can take images fast enough for um, some of the work that um, Stephen and I have done together. Um, but most of the time, people just use it for guiding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is fair to say that the level of accuracy you need these days is somewhat more than you would have needed 100 years ago, just sort of following up the tail end of this question. But it's not actually as much more as you would think. Mm -hmm. Because stellar images, the 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 uh, projected size of a star on either your film or your electronic detector is still basically the same size now as it was then because it all has to transit through our atmosphere. And so the, the level of correction required is actually pretty similar. Mm -hmm. It's just that now it's done mostly automatically yeah. rather than by hand. Um, so let's say we went back in time before computers <clears throat> and we wanted to build a 4.3 meter telescope what would the LDT look like, and how would its size be different? It, it, there's a couple problems there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we're talking, you know, pre-computers. Right, mm -hmm. right. Well, I mean, there's an example. Okay, go ahead. Um, Palomar. Mm -hmm. the, fi the, the five meter at Palomar was designed pre-digital computer. 
And if you want to, I mean, okay, five meters is a little bit bigger than 4.3 meters. But how, how thick is that glass but compared that, to the that LED mirror? mirror that, that is one of the big differences. Mm -hmm. um, that, that mirror is probably well, it 200 inches divided, by it's probably 35 or 40 inches thick. And I'd have to look it up to be yeah. sure, but the, the LDT mirror is four inches thick. Like it is, it is 170 inches in diameter, but it's only four inches thick. The traditional classical ratio of thickness to mirror size used to be roughly six to one. So, you know, for a 24 inch mirror that someone might consider figuring by hand, that would be about as thick as the LDT mirror is, except the LDT mirror is seven times the size of that. Number. Yeah, so that, that thick mirror means you have to have a bigger telescope, it's a bigger dome, I mean, it's the scale. It's pretty much everything. Yeah. Everything uh, is bigger. And then when you have, um, when we when you have something thin like the LDT, which and you wouldn't have done back mm -hmm. then, because you do have to have computer control to mm -hmm. make sure that the shape um, is, you know, accurate as it moves. Mm -hmm. But when you have a thicker mirror, you don't need to do that. But at the same time, it takes a lot longer to equil equilibrate to the to the to the air temperature. You know, at, mm -hmm. as night sets in, the air temperature is dropping and the telescope temperature is following behind and dropping. And so that means that the um the focus is changing throughout mm -hmm. the night. And so and that can you know that means that your images might not be as good as yeah. as as they could be, mm -hmm. um, as that as the um, as the mirror continually cools. So yeah, I mean, it's almost as if there have been advances. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's astronomy. I mean, you go yes, back, Galileo's first telescope. It's yeah. That diameter is. We keep. It's technology keeps advancing and. And, and discoveries march along with the dis, with the technology. As the technology improves, then we get to see fainter objects further back in time, and then more discoveries follow. I think one of the, one of the things that stood out to me years ago when the Hubble did the deep space view, that was cool. looking in space where telescopes have looked, but they did for a long time. Yes. And found all these new galaxies and everything because we had better technology. Better technology. Looking at the same thing, but in a, with better instruments, right. and that's going to continue to happen, isn't it? That's right. That's what has happened all through time yeah. with astronomy. Yeah. I mean, if you you can look up at the moon and just look at it with your naked eye, mm -hmm. but if you have a telescope, you can see a lot yeah. more, and um, that's the kind of leaping of of um, knowledge that we've mm -hmm. gotten by being able to collect more light, get more resolution, look further away, look further back in time. So let's talk about some of those other research projects that have been done with LDT that because of the power of it has allowed us to advance in this way and see things different. We talked about the DART mission a little bit. Mm -hmm. What are some other research projects that, that have really benefited from the, the big eye of the LDT and its suite of instruments? <laughs> and I think we're both laughing here because as astronomers, there's never a telescope that's big enough or that you yeah. have enough time on, right? You you always need a larger telescope and you always need more time. And so it's like, what doesn't benefit from that? But I mean, it's, it's fair to say, we've talked a little bit about the express project to characterize exoplanets. Mm -hmm. When that project was being conceived, they were looking for a host telescope. And part of that is a telescope that was big enough to provide enough photons that you could actually do. I mean, the spectra here are very high resolution, which means you need to capture an enormous amount of light. So you 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 require a big telescope, but then you require a lot of time on it. But you don't want it all as one block. You want as many small blocks as possible. I mean, truthfully, they ask me regularly, "Can we just have an hour a night?" And the mm -hmm. answer is, "I can't do that," but I can give you. But we can keep asking. Oh, and, and, and well, they should. <laughs> yep, maybe but I one can day. give you a quarter night every third night. Mm -hmm. And the truth was, no one else could commit to that. And for that kind of project, it's that cadence that makes the, the process of discovery so much more possible. And so it's, it's a combination of the telescope is big enough that you can get enough light combined with the flexibility to say, yeah, we can give you 
every 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 other night, literally, sometime on the telescope. Um, yep, but I think that um, you know, just there's been such a wide range of science done mm -hmm. on the. And well, that's something we covered throughout the year, from yeah, the inner yeah. solar system to all the way out to yeah. You know, um, to far far galaxies, mm -hmm. and um, there's just so much work that, uh, I mean, what can't you do there? I mean, I guess there are a few things you can't do if we <laughs> <laughs> ultraviolet is blocked by the atmosphere, so we can't mm -hmm. do that. But um, uh, and certain infrared wavelengths as well. But um, you know, that's those are the limitations. Is really what mm -hmm. does the atmosphere not transmit? Other than that. Um, you know, we can, you know, the telescope is, it can be and is used for such a wide range of science. So maybe mention some of those, yeah. some of the different projects. Yeah. Uh, Give you a, a, yeah. A, a really near, a very close by example that you would think, well, we probably already know the answer, but the answer is we don't. The LDT from ground up was designed, among other things, to facilitate observations of things in our solar system, mm -hmm. which means that small things where you might say, well, what difference does that make? we can do projects that would be basically difficult or untenable elsewhere. The, the LDT can point lower than most similar telescopes. So you can follow comets way down into right. the, to the horizon. But it yep. also means we, we, we can point closer to the sun without pointing at the sun. We never want the sun. Yeah, no, never, never. Not unless you want to melt it. <laughs> for example, we have someone who's interested in following things around. We have several groups following observations around Mercury. Mercury never gets more than about 45 minutes to an hour away from the sun mm -hmm. time-wise, but you can't observe it when the sun is up, not with this type of the most major optical scope. So you're limited to this window when the sun's just gone down, but Mercury's still up, and it's all the way down low anyway. And if your telescope stops here, then you get maybe 20 minutes. If your telescope stops here, you get 45 minutes to an hour. And it sounds like a trivial difference but it means you can do things that other people can't do. Mm -hmm. And we can afford to schedule the telescope knowing these observations are coming. Um, often it means that you know, we can schedule them when the sun is setting, which is safer. We can schedule them when the sun is rising, which means we send somebody upstairs to say, okay, close everything up, the sun is coming up, mm -hmm. because you don't want the sun illuminating the telescope. But it also means you can look for things in places that other people would have trouble. But it also means that you could afford to, you know, when we designed the telescope, another specification was to keep down what's known as scattered light. And think about, you know, if you point your camera near a bright source, you know, my hands are kind of reflected, you know, are, are very almost specularly reflective light right now. It's not, you can't really see any detail, but if you can, if you can shadow that and keep that extra scattering away, you can see faint things there. And so we have people who want to do faint fuzzy objects. And I know you've talked to folks who've done that in mm -hmm. past live streams. And part of the design of the telescope was explicitly to minimize any stray light getting into the image or any scattering coming into it. And the telescope, it took us a while. We didn't get it right from the beginning, but the telescope was designed with that in mind so that people could look at, for example, outer portions of cometary Comey or the outer edges of faint dwarf galaxies mm -hmm. and be able to distinguish structures there that you couldn't see with a telescope that was less well, basically less well baffled. Yep. Um, One of the things we haven't talked about yet that I just wanted to mention here, Kevin, is how cool it is to be out there at the telescope. <laughs> yeah. And I know that we haven't talked about it tonight, but I know that in previous casts, you've, you know, you've visited the there's LDT the, as there's well. There's the human side of, Absolutely. of doing science. Yeah, and I will say that um, going out to the telescope, I love going out to the telescope and just standing up on that um, on the observing deck and just watching the dome open, watching the mirror covers open on the telescope, and then just watching the telescope move and trying not to fall over because when you're looking <laughs> up and then things start moving, you know, the <laughs> inner ear does weird things. And so, but um, it's just really spectacular to be out there and to watch this telescope really move. It's not entirely silent, silent but it is very quiet mm -hmm. and just, and it can move fast because as Stephen said, that was one of the, um, 
one of the um, the parameters in the building was being able to just follow things quick that are moving quickly across the sky. And so just watching it sort of do its own, do its thing and kind of do this ballet during the night. I, I, I mean, it's not science, but I'm just going to be here to say that I love it. <laughs> well, it gets, it gets to that core of inspiration. It really I does. Mean, that's, that's one of our goals here is to inspire the universe, but it also gets back to probably how you started. You didn't you didn't get interested in astronomy because you were looking at a computer screen with a bunch of numbers. Well, how, how do you know? Right, it, could <laughs> <laughs> it could be. But, I mean, how, how did you both get interested in astronomy in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. No, you, you're absolutely right. How did you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's that, it's that all in wonder of yeah. looking up. It's looking up and, and looking connecting. through telescopes. Yeah, and looking at that computer screen. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think I, I got I got interested in college when um, I was taking observing classes mm -hmm. and um, just looking at the moon and looking at objects in our solar system through telescopes. And um, I mean, when I was in college, I was I was studying to be an engineer, and I got a little distracted by all of these uh, these um, astronomy classes. And and look, here I am, still doing this. And you, and, and at that early stage, you were on the team that co-discovered the atmosphere of Pluto. Yes, I mean that that, that was one. Going. That was one of those things that you know, <laughs> once you once you do something like that, it's kind of hard to turn back and. Uh, um, and just being part of the discovery, part of the work of astronomy, and being, I mean, and this was the first major observatory I ever visited was Lowell Observatory, and it was spectacular, and I was hooked, and that was like, that was the end of it. And you said, <laughs> I want to work there for the rest of I my career? I want to work there for the rest yeah. of my career. That's what I said then. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but it was, I mean, just visiting Lowell and, and using, obviously the LDT didn't exist at, at that point, but um, I, I, my first telescope that I used here was the 31, 31 inch out on Anderson Mesa. Mm -hmm. And it was, it, I mean, there was, there was no other, it was nothing else for me after that. It was just so, it was just that cool. And so I think that, you know, when people come here to Lowell and use the telescopes here, I can mm -hmm. imagine people, I hope people are having similar experiences. Well, that's, you know, our, in our public telescopes, the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory, mm -hmm. when you see this building roll back and there's six different telescopes look pointing at six different things. And it's it's so inspirational. Or, you know, we're we're right next to downtown Flagstaff with 70,000 people. Or as the crow flies, it's less than a mile from downtown. And yet you can look down there and see town, and you look it up in the sky and see the Milky Way. See the Milky Way. Yeah. I, I mean, I've seen people come to tears because they've never seen that. And we're right in the middle of we're a city town, that right. happens to be. Um, mm -hmm. Protect the dark sky. I was going to say, you have to give a city. real shout out to yeah. the city and the county for decades worth of That's right. lighting code protection. Yeah. And Basically the world's first preserved. outdoor lighting code was here in Flagstaff That's in 1958. Right. Yeah. Preserve right. the access to the mm -hmm. to the dark to the night sky for everybody. Um, it's not just for telescopes. Yeah. Now we've just got a couple minutes left. So Stephen, we didn't talk about how you got interested in astronomy if it wasn't looking at the computer screen <laughs> or. <laughs> Um, so, so let's hear that before we sign off. I, and some of it was just looking up. Mm -hmm. There was a certain amount of that. And then somewhere early on, there was the winding up in the museum basement, making it, grinding a mirror for a telescope. Um, obviously, I was hooked by that point, And yet, that's a purely analog. Like how very, he did it. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly how he mm -hmm. did it. Uh, I'm reasonably sure that the technique had not changed much between, <laughs> the, between the, when Clyde, made, when his Clyde made his and when I did mine, and I'm nowhere near as, as old as he would be now. Yeah. Uh, but the, the basics of pushing a piece of glass over another piece of glass mm -hmm. with carborundum grit between them and walking around the barrel is still the same, and people still do it. And there is a there's a real connection to, you know, not only not only the connection to the sky, but to building the equipment you're using at some level. And the truth is I couldn't build the LDT on my own and I love using it, but I still come back to the small scopes too. And it, do, it does connect us. Our, you know, our founder, when his first conscious memory was looking at a comet when he was three years old, and then he got a telescope when he was 15 and viewed the cosmos. Car Clyde Tomba, who grew up on a farm and what do you do at night on a farm? We looked at the dark skies mm -hmm. in Kansas, and it was, it was still dark. Yeah, and it, it's this it's this human interest in the universe that really spurs us on. And the Lowell Discovery Telescope really captures that. We have 
real humans. Um, you know, astronomers are actually people uh, <laughs> with <laughs> emotions, and <laughs> contrary to popular belief. No, um, but, but, but I mean, it really gets to the core. The LDT gets to the core of, of why we're here and what we do, mm -hmm. the inspiration and the excitement about science. It, it really is, and it's also it's connecting us to the universe, mm -hmm. right? Because sometimes it's hard to see, um, you know, the very, well, you know, we see what we can see in our night sky, but then at a place like LDT where it's so dark and you can see, you know, you can see so many stars and the telescope itself can see even more. And, yep. and really, yeah. yeah. It's, it's worth pointing out that you can also put an eyepiece on this telescope. We haven't really yes. talked about this, but it is in all the best senses of the word, a stunning amateur telescope too, <laughs> because you can look at things with the human eye except that the telescope collects so much more light that things that you're used to seeing as this faint fuzzy thing and it's gray suddenly has color. Yeah, and you know, we don't over do it very yeah. often, I grant you, but we do. And you, and you, as, as I, I will sign off after this, but you have been here since the beginning. So you showed people like Neil Armstrong views yeah. through the telescope, Don Johansson who discovered Lucy, you've shown him views, views through the telescope. It's not something we can do often because Usually they're scientific instruments, but when that option is there, it's it, it's really cool. It, it it it's a really cool experience, but it's also, if you think about it in a very specific way, it, it could be an amazing outreach experience mm -hmm. too. Yeah. It, it it is the kind of thing where people go, I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. And, and and that gets to the core of why we do all this. Absolutely. One of the many. Yeah. Yep. So it looks like we're out of time. Um, this, this is, we can talk about all this all night. I mean, all the stuff telescopes need in the universe. Um, but thanks, Amanda and Stephen, for joining us in the last uh, program of the year celebrating the LDT, but certainly not the end of the celebration, because as our scientists continue to use it, we continue to celebrate um, how powerful it is, the discoveries that they can make with it, and the ongoing research they can do with it. And so even though this is the end of this series this year, we'll continue I'm just celebrate the Lowell Discovery Telescope and we'll be talking more with you guys about it. Well, I think we have to thank you as well yes. for hosting this over the year, honestly. Well, it's been great. To, it's been great to, an honor to be able to talk about this. I, you know, this is cool. We get to talk about this. Get paid for it. We'll see you at the 20th. Yeah. <laughs> so everybody watching, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for joining us this year. And all of these programs um, are available on YouTube. Um, they're live right now, but you can watch them at any time, as well as so many of our other um, programs we've done. We've got an outstanding um, podcast called Star Stuff, which we're going to do, um, we're starting next season for. Um, and there's just so many great opportunities, both in person and virtual, to explore the universe um, through the eyes of our scientists and our educators here at Lowell Observatory. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for your support. And we hope to see you up here soon.